Hello, my name is Jim Pickett, and I'm the Senior Director of Prevention, Advocacy, and Gay Men's Health at AIDS Foundation of Chicago. I certainly wish I was welcoming you all here in our beautiful balmy city, but maybe next time. On behalf of my fellow members of the CROI Community Liaison Subcommittee, Don Averett and Intando Yola, I am delighted to introduce the Martin Delaney presentation. We could not be more thrilled at this opportunity to feature the voices of community and activism during this opening plenary of Virtual CROI 2021. Something unusual for CROI, but something I hope we carry forward. First, I'd like to give you a little background on Martin Delaney. While remaining HIV negative himself, Martin was a prominent advocate and activist on behalf of people living with HIV, like me. He challenged the government and drug companies to expedite access to experimental treatments in the early days of the epidemic, and he helped to co-found Project Inform. In a statement made upon Martin's death from liver cancer in 2009, Dr. Tony Fauci said as follows, Millions of people are now receiving life-saving antiretroviral medications from a treatment pipeline that Marty Delaney played a role, a key role, in opening and expanding. Today's Martin Delaney presentation features two global powerhouse activists, Fatima Hassan and Greg Gonzalez, who will discuss the worldwide battle to ensure everyone across the planet is vaccinated against SARS-CoV-2 while connecting the dots to similar struggles around ARV access. Coalitions among activists, affected communities, and scientists were crucial and remain crucial for the fight against AIDS. Similar collaborations are absolutely vital now in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. Fatima Hassan, a South African human rights lawyer and social justice activist, is the founder of the Health Justice Initiative. She is the former executive director of the Open Door Open Society Foundation for South Africa, heading the foundation for six years from mid-2013 to mid-2019, and has dedicated her professional life to defending and promoting human rights in South Africa, especially in the field of HIV, where she worked for the AIDS Law Project and engaged with the Treatment Action Campaign in many of its legal cases. Fatima is also the host of a special COVID-19 and IP-related podcast called Access, which I highly suggest you check out. You can go to www.volume.africa access and listen. She actually used to share an office with Greg in Cape Town when he was working for the AIDS and Rights Alliance for Southern Africa. After his being involved with Early Act Up in the States and co-founding the Treatment Action Group. Greg Gonzalez, a 2018 MacArthur Fellow, is now an assistant professor in the Department of the Epidemiology of Microbial Diseases at the Yale School of Public Health and a faculty member of the Yale Public Health Modeling Unit. He is also an associate professor at the Yale Law School, where he co-directs the Yale Global Health Justice Partnership. His research focuses on the intersection of substance use, and infectious diseases. And now, without further ado, let me turn it over to Fatima and Greg for Vaccine Nationalism is Killing Us, How Inequities in Research and Access to SARS-CoV-2 Vaccines Will Perpetuate the Pandemic. Thank you. Hi. So Fatima, we're back together again. Uh, across oceans this time. Um, and it feels so familiar from the days when we used to share an office in Cape Town fighting for access to antiretroviral treatment. Um, but I wanna explore first, what do you think the similarities are between today's struggle for uh, access to COVID vaccines and the ones we faced in the past? What are the similarities? What are the differences? You go first and then I'll chime in afterwards. Great, and, and thanks Jim and thanks Greg and to the organizers of CROI. So as you all know, Greg and I have been friends for over 20 years and, you know, we're doing this session with quite a heavy heart because I think it's going to be years before I'm going to be able to travel to actually see Greg in person or vice versa. Um, and and, and we'll, we'll explore the reasons for that and what it means for people in the Global South right now 
given that there are vaccines that are safe and effective, but which we simply can't get access to. So if we look back to, you know, how the HIV AIDS years unravel, and Greg and I met because he was actually invited to come into our country to help us with treatment literacy around the safety and efficacy of use of ARVs in, in a number of our populations in the public and private health sector. But that was at a time when the HIV AIDS crisis was causing so much unnecessary suffering and death and premature suffering and death because of two reasons. The one was a state-sponsored AIDS denialism. It was the position of government at that time in South Africa that HIV AIDS did not, that HIV AIDS, that HIV didn't cause AIDS, that ARVs should not be used in the public sector. Um, and so the second reason why we were dealing with that kind of scale of suffering and death was also because of what we regarded as a pernicious form of profiteering over patients' lives. And that was in relation to the manner in which pharmaceutical companies were actually conducting their business and their operations, which we see many similarities, you know, uh, currently in 2020 and 2021, which effectively meant that the intellectual property protections that were governing uh, the, the use of ARVs in the global south, that that meant that millions of people couldn't access it and couldn't access it timely, which resulted in their basically in their premature death. Great. Thanks, Fatima. Thanks, Fatima. Um, so I, I can dial back the clock a little bit further. Um, you know, I, I graduated from high school in 1981, tell you how old I am. Um, but it was the Reagan years, and it took our president, President Reagan, seven years to say the word HIV, to say the word AIDS um, during his, 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 his tenure as president of this country. Um, as Larry Kramer said back then, um, AIDS was about disposable people, people who didn't matter. Um, they were uh, gay men, they were people who used drugs, they were people who were engaged in sex work, they were people of color across the United States. Um, these were disposable people who really didn't merit a full-scale research prevention treatment enterprise by the largest country on earth. Uh, and millions uh, of people around the world suffered from, from those early decisions which delayed the fight against AIDS uh, uh, many, many years ago now for many of us. Um, if you fast forward to the current moment, um, we see another set of disposable people in the United States. The impact of COVID-19 among communities of color in the United States is just um, horrifying when you compare it with their um, uh, European American counterparts. Um, and as we'll talk about in a little, in a little while, the, even as we are on the cusp of being able to, to perhaps control uh, the pandemic in the United States, people of color are still at the back of the line. Um, and so the, the injustices of the early AIDS epidemic are being recapitulated all these years later. Um, you know, I do remember the years of um, uh, working together in South Africa and the enormous pain and suffering uh, and sadness that we all felt. Um, and many of us didn't think we would have to um, see this again, right? We thought um, one pandemic was enough for a lifetime. Uh, unfortunately, we're, we're here uh, in the midst of a second one. Um, but I wanna pivot to something a little bit more um, hopeful, I think, and it's about solidarity. Um, scientists were very important to us all along, right? Um, uh, we were sitting here at a scientific conference, listening to scientific data and presentations about um, new clinical trials, new basic research. Um, but um, how do you think scientists um, um, were important in the, the struggle for access to antiretroviral therapy in South Africa? And why are they important to have them at our side again, Fatima? Thanks, Greg. So, I mean, let, let's just take a step back. We're dealing with a situation where one year into this pandemic and, you know, soon the anniversary of the declaration of the pandemic is upon us. We've had over 17,000 healthcare workers dying around the world. And in many countries, most healthcare workers, uh, including scientists and clinicians in those countries, haven't even received a vaccine or very few of them have received a vaccine. I mean, in my own country in South Africa, with our history of the HIV AIDS crisis, where we had, you know, at least 350,000 people who died unnecessarily and millions of people who died because of HIV AIDS, we've had less than 50,000 healthcare workers uh, you know, being being vaccinated, and we're still waiting for supplies through what's called a study trial through the Johnson and Johnson one dose vaccine for the cohort of healthcare workers, and and we need to vaccinate about seven hundred thousand healthcare workers, and that's just the situation in South Africa. I mean, vaccinations have only started in Ghana and Ivory Coast and in Kenya this week. That's February 2021, one year into this pandemic, when 
you know, hundreds of thousands of people were already vaccinated with the COVID-19 or different uh, forms of the COVID-19 vaccine from Christmas 2020 already. And so the situation that we're in, in, in relation to these allyship and the moral compass that scientists present and brings with it is that two things have happened with COVID. Uh, the first is that there's been accelerated vaccine research, which would not have happened without scientists and clinicians and healthcare workers, you know, who basically propped up the entire world's healthcare systems around the world. And the second is that that knowledge and data has in this unprecedented manner actually translated into safe and effective vaccines. And that is something that took very long, obviously, with HIV AIDS, which is why it led to a lot of you know, um, prolonged suffering and a lot of opportunistic infections that we had to deal with and a lot of morbidity and also mortality. So the, the role that scientists and clinicians and healthcare workers have played in this pandemic is, I think, really something that needs to be recognized and saluted. But we've also lost a lot of key HIV AIDS researchers and clinicians. I mean, in South Africa, we lost Kita Ranji quite early on from COVID-19. We're losing more people in Uganda, in Nigeria, in Zimbabwe. You know, people who are the pioneers of public health care systems in those countries are getting, are getting sick with COVID-19 and dying. One of the key things that the WHO DG has said was that we as a global community need to vaccinate in the first 100 days of 2021 all healthcare workers around the world. That is not happening. And so the similarities, and that's why we say that we're doing this with such a heavy heart, like Greg said, we never thought we would have to deal with two pandemics in our lifetime. And with the very same conduct, with the very same approach to not prioritizing public health, to not prioritizing those people who are the most vulnerable, particularly in the global south. So once again, we're in a situation, Greg, you remember, you know, the, the, the struggles we had in South Africa at that time. I mean, you would see me on a daily basis about how we tried to ensure that everybody who was the most vulnerable got access. Once again, we're in a situation in the world where everybody in the global south is at the back of the queue. Black and brown people are at the back of the queue. We're still waiting for supplies, for something that could actually work, that could actually take us out of this pandemic. So, you know, a year ago already we said, uh, as activists who had worked on HIV AIDS, Greg, you, you were part of that, you know, myself, many others said, if you follow the same trajectory of the HIV AIDS pandemic, we're going to have an access crisis. And so here we are in March 2021, we, we're facing a global uh, access crisis. The WHO DG has called it a moral catastrophe. Many other leaders have actually called it a crisis that is unprecedented in our lifetime, not a, just a pandemic that is unprecedented, but it's also a moral crisis that we're now facing of limited access. And it's very similar, it's eerily similar to the access battles that we had around HIV AIDS. Mm -hmm. And, you know, something's got to give. So the scientists and clinicians, to come to your question, Greg, who supported us during the HIV AIDS years, did two important things. They contributed to scientific knowledge, which they're doing right now. But secondly, they called it out. They called the nationalism out, they called governments out, they called pharmaceuticals companies out, and they insisted that there be equitable access where public health was prioritized. And I mean, many of those scientists and clinicians are actually at the forefront of COVID-19 research in South Africa, in other parts of the world as well. And so we look to them again for their leadership, for them to be the compass to shine, for example, a spotlight on the issues of inequity in relation to vaccine access for COVID-19. Greg? So th thanks, Fatima. You know, activists like to name and shame, uh, but I'd like to name and blame, uh, name and claim right now and claim our history. Um, and, and scientists have been incredible allies for us through the course of the epidemic. And I think we, we should remember right now, David Katzenstein and James Hakim to, um, people who are well known to the Cori community who died of COVID this year, but were instrumental in, in the fight for access to antiretroviral therapy uh, on the African continent. Um, but you can go back further and further into time. Statisticians like Susan Ellenberg and Victor De Guitola, who introduced many of us to the ACTG through the statistical working group, Judith Feinberg and Bill Powderly, who took up the fight that we uh, launched for uh, treatment and prevention of opportunistic diseases way before highly active antiretroviral therapy for ART. Um, even, even more um, recent examples um, of John Moore and Nicolene, uh, uh, John Moore and Betty Korber in the United States working against AIDS, and AIDS denialism, both in South Africa 
uh, and across America. And, and in, in, in the most recent years, people like Rochelle Walensky, our new CDC director, who spoke out against um, price gouging for PrEP uh, by Gilead and, and, and other pharmaceutical companies. So scientists have been there all along in, in the fight against HIV. And it's not a coincidence that the voices that you hear uh, now in the United States and around the world are the same voices, Carlos Del Rio, Mark Lipsitch, Rochelle Walensky, others um, who have basically stepped in where governments um, have failed us and uh, taken up not just the scientific challenge, but the, the challenge as global citizens to figure out how to deal with this new crisis. Um, we'll talk about what we can all do um, moving forward together as a scientific and activist community. Um, but I wanna pivot now to how the current global order is failing us. It's creating disorder. It's ruining lives. It's giving the virus the upper hand. And there are institutions that were supposed to be here to, to make things better. COVAX, the Act Accelerator, the World Health Organization, the WTO. Fatim, would you like to sort of um, start off and talk about how some of these institutions are dragging us down and making things worse at the current moment? Thanks. Um, you know, and it's, I think your question is linked to something that we warned about in March of 2020 already, and that is if you only rely on goodwill and you only rely on benevolence, then you won't have equitable, genuine global access for all people who need it the most. And with COVID-19 in particular, there is definitely an allocation prioritization that needs to happen. You can't jump to the front of the queue just because you're from the US or because you have money or because you have medical insurance. So. The issue around equitable access was something that had partially seized some of these institutions uh, sort of mandate uh, from around mid of 2020. But already by late 2020, organizations such as Oxfam and Human Rights Watch had been tracking the number of bilaterals and the potential for these so-called global mechanisms to address equity, to actually provide the necessary supplies to the whole world and warned already from September and October of 2020 that there was a uh, you know, massive buyout of supplies or what we call pre-commitments through advanced market commitments, as well as uh, purchasing some of the supplies in what's called COVAX, which is meant to be the mechanism that is supposed to address some of the needs of middle income and low income countries through a, you know, quite a complex funding model. And, and we have our own views about COVAX. Many organizations such as MSF, my own organization, have argued that it's not transparent, it's not accountable, and that it's actually perpetuating the inequalities because it allows rich countries to get to the front of the queue within COVAX as well as to get to the front of the queue around bilateral supplies. So the situation we had, Greg, in the beginning of January was very similar to the HIV AIDS situation. The vaccines were where the people were not and the people were not where the vaccines were. And so healthcare workers as a result in the global south were not receiving any vaccines in early January while many countries or what we call the wealthier nations had actually started vaccinating large parts of their population. So, you know, I think that's the situation we have where the mechanisms that were created to try and address equitable supplies and equitable access and equitable allocation have now uh, basically admitted that there is a supply crisis. We believe that that supply crisis has been self-created because there hasn't been a sharing of knowledge. So all of the scientists, all of the healthcare workers that work so hard to accelerate vaccine research, that research is being hoarded, it's not being shared on a widespread basis. And without the you know, transfer of the technology and without the transfer of the vaccine know-how, you basically can't have a people's vaccine, right? You can't scale up manufacturing for the whole world for everyone who needs a vaccine immediately. So where we at is that COVAX has indicated um, through its own forecast, through its own predictions, that because of the supply shortages that we are facing, they are only likely to cover about 27% of vulnerable populations in low-income countries by the end of 2021. This week, the WHO indicated that while some supplies have started arriving from COVAX for some countries in Africa, that's only likely to cover 2 to 3% of those populations by the first quarter of 2021. 
So we have a severe crisis. The, the second way in which you can access vaccines is obviously through direct engagements with certain companies whose vaccines have been regarded as safe and effective or have emergency use authorization. And I mean, Greg, you can speak to this because you know the data much better and how sort of the data is being interpreted for a country like South Africa with, with, with the variants that are now uh, emerging and, and, and the way in which the virus is mutating. Um, and in respect of bilaterals, again, there's limited supplies. A lot of the dosages have actually been promised to some of the richer countries. And that's what we mean by vaccine nationalism. The world engage in nationalistic behavior towards the later part of 2020 and early 2021. We call it hedging your bets, where you're trying to get supplies from as many different sources, with the result that many countries, over 130 countries in the global south, have very limited access to vaccines. And in the absence of an urgent scale-up of manufacturing, manufacturing that Tony Fauci has spoken about, that uh, the WHO DG has spoken about, that the Vatican has even spoken about, you're basically not going to achieve widespread immunity and widespread immunization in the world for at least another three to four years, which, you know, you, as, as scientists and as clinicians, you all know what the public health consequences of that means. Greg? So... Um you know, one thing that's emerged over the past few months is the um, emergence of variants from all around the world. Um, and uh, as someone who was trained late in life in evolutionary biology, it's, it's not a surprise to me. If you let a virus um, uh, replicate uncontrolled, um, over time it's going to accumulate mutations and mutations that confer uh, better fitness uh, than wild type. And we've seen it with the B117 variant, which is, which is rising to take over populations in, in the UK and Europe and now in the United States. But the point is, is that vaccine nationalism isn't just bad from a humanitarian or moral sense. From a public health sense, it's a catastrophe. Um, because if you vaccinate one part of a population um, and you leave the other unvaccinated, it just leads variants to spread. Um, and, you know, and whether we're talking about our two countries, Fatima, the United States and South Africa, or within my own country, um, the, the vaccine uh, distribution plan in the United States has been wildly skewed uh, against communities of color who have been unvaccinated in, in all 50 states, less than their, than their white counterparts. And so we're basically gonna be chasing variants for, for, for the foreseeable future until we get vaccination out across the world. Um, not just as a matter of um, uh, moral imperative, but a, 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 a epidemiological imperative too. Um, what's interesting is that um, while activists and scientists have been calling for a scale up of, of um, the, the production of vaccines, James Carlenstein and Peter Staley, well known to AIDS activists, um, along with Wafa El Sadr, well known to the Cori community and a physician researcher at Columbia University, called for a president's emergency plan for vaccine access and relief in January uh, in the New York Times, saying we need to scale up M mRNA vaccines. Um, interestingly, Tom Frieden, the former CDC director, just a few days ago made uh, uh, the same um, cri de corps uh, for scaling up mRNA vaccines, along with Marine Lucinier, who is former msf -er. um, And so the, the, the path is, is being laid out in front of us. We can scale up vaccines together um, to cover the entire world, and we can do it at cost, and we can do it fairly. Um, but the current institutions are basically failing all of us, right? You know, it's not okay to say we're going to we're going to cover twenty to twenty seven percent of people within the next twelve months yeah. outside of the rich countries of the global north. Um, it doesn't make any sense scientifically, epidemiologically, or morally, and we've got to hit a reset button right now, right? Some people have said. Uh, um, uh, uh, that we don't have capacity to, to make more mRNA vaccines right now. Well, we could probably scale up mRNA vaccine cover, uh, production over the next 12 to 18 months um, if we start now, right? It's not impossible. It, it, the cost of it will, it will be dwarfed by the current um, COVID relief, but we just passed through Congress. Um, and so we could set up programs now to scale up vaccine um, uh, production across the world, enable technology transfer to, to, to factories and manufacturers in the global south who are willing to supply for their regions. Um, there's a path forward that leads us out of this crisis, um, but our current global institutions are failing us and they need to do better. Um, Fata, I wanted to, uh, before we talk about but what Craig, can you do, know, I mean, that's such an important point and, and why are we surprised that this is the same you know, situation that played out with HIV AIDS about 
who gets to the front of a queue, who gets preferential access, when transfer of technology takes place, where drug companies, in my view, play God. And, and once again, we're in a situation where drug companies are playing God in a pandemic. I mean, you talk about the mRNA technology that was co-developed and co-funded by the NIH in the USA. There's other vaccine technologies that were co-funded and developed by, by the UK government, by the German government. I mean, these governments have to march in, right? They co-own this. The public co-owns this technology. This technology should not be hoarded. Uh, the governments need to step in and insist on technology transfer. We're still waiting for voluntary cooperation. I mean, you know, it's only recently that Dr. Tony Fauci and the WHO has actually said, we need a relaxation of the patent regime. This, we are in a moral catastrophe. This is a crisis. It's unprecedented, the, the, the scale of the havoc that is being caused in the global south, not just the socioeconomic crisis, but the strain on healthcare systems, the interruption of ARV and, and, and TV services, the repressions, the multiple lockdowns. I mean, you know, there is a scale of, of uh, moral responsibility and also, you know, obviously legal responsibility. The trade rules allow this, these kind of measures. But we, we are just surprised that governments, once again, I mean, our, for example, our government never issued a compulsory license or took compulsory action against drug companies at the height of the HIV AIDS crisis. We thought it would do it in this pandemic, and it hasn't. And your governments can actually help us, but your governments are blocking, for example, the waiver request at the WTO, which is being discussed this week. So I think that it's not just the drug companies that are culpable and that are going to be responsible when, when the books of this pandemic are written, they will all be listed in there. But it's also your government, my government, you know, every single authority that is not willing to take on systemic power that says to drug companies and shareholders and CEOs, it is not okay for black and brown people to have to wait for vaccine access when there are at least five vaccines that are considered safe and effective for human use. It's not okay for healthcare workers in parts of the global south, in fact, in many parts of the global south, to be still waiting for a vaccine. That is just unacceptable. And the scientific community, you know, like they did with HIV AIDS, they marched with us, Professor Linda Gail Becker, Glenda Gray, James McIntyre, all of the people who are well known to the Croy community, Dr. Francois Fenter. These are the clinicians who are our experts in all of our cases, and they marched with us in the streets. They participated in civil disobedience because we have to you know, uh, it, it enrages us, obviously, you and I, Greg, because we've been, you know, here before, but we are not just angry activists. We are saying to the world that there is a crisis and everybody actually has to step up and we cannot wait for volunteerism and for benevolence and for charity. I mean, I think somebody, you know, a few weeks ago said it quite carefully and clearly, philanthropy will not buy you equality. And so, Greg, I think you're right. The WHO, COVAX, all of these institutions that are meant to actually be scaling up supplies need to act with a bit more, I think, of uh, force and I think need to act with a bit more pressure, not just the moral pressure, but I think also, you know, they need to now insist on certain minimum norms and standards, because if this is the way we're dealing with this pandemic, you know, which we thought would be different after the HIV AIDS pandemic, then what happens with the next pandemic? It means we'll never get to a system where we actually have equitable health and where we actually decolonize uh, public health. Great. So look, I mean, I think Dr. Moore, you and I are saying is that COVID vaccines should be a global public good, right? Um, and what yeah. we've done is surrender to the market. We surrendered to the market early on in this epidemic in terms of which hospitals got PPE, which countries got PPE, who got ventilators, who didn't get ventilators, who in the city of Boston got access to remdesivir uh, at Mass General when you couldn't get it at Boston Medical Center. So we've surrendered to the market thinking the market would provide, but the market has basically yeah. said, what can you pay me? Um, and mm. so Gavi and COVAX have cut deals with Pfizer uh, and Moderna um, at what price and at what development costs um, uh, uh, to the public. Um, and so we need greater transparency. We need developing countries to be part of these discussions about how um, vaccines are gonna be allocated across the world. And we need countries to stop hoarding vaccines. Even exactly. before we think about scaling up uh, production, we need countries like Canada and others who, who've, who've, who've gone to the COVAX facilities to get vaccines for their own mm -hmm. countries to stop hoarding vaccines. Um, and again, again, Fatima and I have been saying this over and over throughout this presentation. Um, this is not a, uh, simply, uh, we're not asking scientists and clinicians and, and, and Corey attendees to, to answer a moral or humanitarian call. Yes, we are. 
Um, but there's a deep abiding self-interest in doing this right. right? If we do not vaccinate yeah. the world's population to a significant degree, we are gonna be able to ever have a Croy in person again. Um, we're gonna see variants yeah. spreading across the globe that are gonna be, that are gonna, um, uh, be resistant to the vaccines we have today and chasing them uh, ad infinitum for the rest of, rest of our lives. And so we have an epidemiological crisis that doesn't work when you have one half of the globe or one half of the country or one half of the state or one half of your city vaccinated. We know what happens to, 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 to infectious diseases left unchecked. That was, the, that was the lesson of the AIDS epidemic, which we all learned too late um, to, create, to avoid a global catastrophe. We're, we're pleading pleading with the attendees at Croy to be activists with us again. Um, maybe you can't march, uh, but you can, you can get on the phones, you can email, you can get on social media and ask for a people's vaccine so that we have access everywhere for everyone. Um, Fatima, we don't have much time left, so I wanna talk about what our presidents can do um, and maybe people yeah. can think about what their presidents can do. Do you wanna start with yours or should I start with mine? Well, let me start with your president, Biden. Um, I mean, you know, the Archbishop of South Africa of the Anglican Church in Southern Africa and the People's Vaccine Campaign of South Africa wrote an open letter to Dr. Tony Fauci and Rachel and many of the progressive scientists that you mentioned. And we've asked the U.S. government and the Biden administration to march in, particularly on the NIH Moderna vaccine, because, you know, when I mentioned earlier that companies were playing God in a pandemic, we have a situation where there are companies whose vaccine work uh, potentially quite, you know, uh, effectively against some of the variants that have been discovered in South Africa and use the mRNA technology that are refusing to enter our country. They're refusing to submit their dossiers for regulatory approval. They only want to serve some of the richer and more wealthier nations. So we have a real crisis around, you know, what you mentioned about taking us out of the public health epidemiological crisis, not just the moral crisis that we're in. So I think that the Biden administration has to definitely use the Defense Act to scale up production for countries just outside of the US to really ramp up. And, and there's some you know, very positive indications. And we're also asking your government to stop blocking the TRIPS waiver, which is being negotiated uh, this week. But, but why don't you continue with, with some additional measures that the Biden administration has to take within the US? And then I'll give you some perspective on uh, what we're calling on President Cyril Ramaphosa to do. Well, so, you know, we, we need the, the president to, to invoke the Defense Production Act for global production, uh, vaccine production, and he has in certain senses for domestic purposes. Um, but we need a real concerted global plan. Um, and that's something that President yeah. Biden can do and, and make a part of his 100 days um, plan. He's saying he wants to get most Americans vaccinated by the summer. I want to hear his goal of what he's thinking about the rest of the globe. President George Bush made a commitment to people all around the world living with HIV um, almost 20 years ago, um, which nobody thought would ever uh, be possible, and he helped to make it a reality. The U U.S. can step up once again and be a leader in the fight against another infectious disease. Um, we also need to sort of get the NIH and our research enterprises to think more globally about global genomic surveillance, about drug development for, for COVID-19, because um, as far as we know, until we get everybody vaccinated, we're going to be dealing with sickness and death um, for, for many, many, many weeks and months to come. So those are the key things I would add. But I really think we need a, a, a global plan um, led by the WHO, frankly, to think about how we're going to get from, from zero to, to 100% vaccination, 90% vaccination across the globe, uh, and without these excuses that we've heard from some of our, uh, uh, our global institutions that have, been com that have been assigned to this task in the, in the past. We only have a minute or so left. Do you want to talk about um, what you think needs to happen at home, Fatima? So I think what's, what's happening at home is that in Geneva, we're asking for a TRIPS waiver, but you know we're waiting for a waiver that is just seems very difficult to materialize in the next few months. So we need to scale up the you know, compulsory transfer of technology. And it's time for our government to actually take compulsory measures and not to allow drug companies to be in the driving seat while we have a massive crisis on our hands and devastating impact of the variants, particularly in the South African context and a real massive strain on healthcare workers and our healthcare system in our country. So we're also calling on President Cyril Ramaphosa to do two things, to stop acting powerless because we have a constitution and we have a lot of rights that we can actually invoke against some 
multinational companies. And secondly, I think he needs to make sure that they, what you said in terms of equitable allocation, there needs to be one for the region. You know, we may be securing some vaccines by the end of this year, but our neighbors, Zimbabwe, Lesotho, Namibia, they also need access. And I think it links to your, your point about regional immunity. Thanks, Fatima and Jim. So any final words? Mine would be act up, fight back, fight COVID. We need your help. Mine would be no vaccine apartheid. Okay, I'll co-sign all of that. And thank you once again for joining us for this talk, Fatima and Greg and all the attendees.